Hello and welcome to another episode of the Alter Your Health podcast. We are live as we always are on every odd numbered episode. It is episode number 121. And this is your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. And I am Dr. Benjamin Alter, your host. I'm your co-host, Dr. Susanna Alter. And this week we are up in Northern Michigan. We are not home, we, were, we are on vacation, but we're still coming at you live as we always will be every Thursday afternoon. At, so the topic of our conversation today is really an important one, an issue that so many people struggle with in, all over the world. And there are so many over-the-counter symptom management drugs, pharmaceuticals, uh, and still this symptom is really poorly you know, controlled in much of our world. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about is acid reflux. Yeah, and I'm so surprised we haven't had an episode on acid reflux yet because it is such a common symptom for people to experience. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about some of the causes of acid reflux, the most common cause that many people overlook, and we're also going to talk about some things that may support you in healing your acid reflux for good. So let's start with some, uh, like, let's talk about what acid reflux is. Yeah, what is it? Well, it's what it sounds like. It's actual stomach acid that's refluxing up the esophagus, and it can cause burning sensations anywhere along the esophagus or in the throat. It can also lead to other symptoms. It can exacerbate asthma. It can lead to dry cough. It can lead to kind of pharyngitis symptoms, sinusitis symptoms. It can lead to a lot of symptoms in our head region, um, and also, of course, a burning sensation in the stomach. So, so what's the difference between acid reflux and GERD? That's a great question because I think these two get confused a lot very often. And to have a diagnosis of GERD, you actually need to have um, some lesions or ulcerations found either in the esophagus or in the stomach. Um, actually, in the stomach, that would be a different diagnosis. That would be peptic ulcer disease. But um, to diagnose GERD, you need to have some imaging done so that you can actually see that there is some erosive damage in the esophagus. So or reflux can acid reflux can lead to gastroesophageal reflux disorder dis mm -hmm. disease. Exactly, exactly. And um, reflux is really just, you know, it's a symptom. It's a symptom that comes with many of these um, stomach issues. Yeah. So I want to talk for a little bit about the conventional management of acid reflux and gastroesophageal, gastroesophageal reflux, reflux disease. Um, these, both of these conditions are managed the same because really they do have some of the same underlying causes. And the conventional approach to managing gastroesophageal reflux and acid reflux is to diminish the acid production in the stomach, right? Mm -hmm. Either with an acid blocker or a proton pump inhibitor, uh, something along that, that line, Pepsid, AC, the, is it what color pill is it? The, the purple, purple pill. The little purple pill. Um, and I don't really know how popular it is in relation to other over-the-counter uh, medications, but I think it's pretty darn popular. I think a lot of people are popping those little purple pills. And since they're over-the-counter, you know, the the um, there's obviously some, you know, pres prescription strength approaches to uh, managing these conditions, which may be, you know, necessary at times. I don't know. Uh, but the over-the-counter approach, a lot of people think, oh, it's just over-the-counter, so what's the big deal? But if we are diminishing our acid production in our stomach, we are diminishing the digestive fire of our digestive processes. We are diminishing the absorption, potentially, of nutrients that, is, uh, that we're taking in in our nutrition. And we're setting ourselves up for malabsorption issues, especially when you consider that people are on these medications for years or decades, 
you know, it, it just really sets the stage for a malnourishment, malabsorption uh, phenomenon and can lead to uh, so many other chronic conditions. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the root cause being the, the use of these, um, you know, somewhat, you know, I think they're recommended as being very safe, but they do have chronic long-term use side effects for sure. Yeah, to put it in perspective, these drugs are really designed to be prescribed in response to acute ulcer disease states where there just was too much acid in the stomach and you needed something quickly to quench the fire. They were designed to be used for two weeks and that would allow enough time to figure out what the underlying cause of this reflux is or this GERD or this ulcer and uh, to take a different approach. But yeah, we that's see... obviously not really the case in the conventional world today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about what some of these causes of acid reflux are. And they are numerous. I mean, there there is a very long list that we're not going to be able to cover today. Um, They include structural abnormalities like a hiatal hernia. They include infectious causes like H. pylori is one of the most common infections that can cause too much acid or too little acid in the stomach. Um, It could be some kind of gastromotility issue like achalasia, which is uh, an issue with being able to swallow properly, spasms in the esophagus. Um, It could be gastroparesis, so your digestive system isn't emptying at the proper rate, Um, so it makes sense that food would reflux. Mm -hmm. But The cause I want to really focus on today is something else, something that I think is often overlooked by many people. Because when we think of acid reflux, the common thought is to assume that there is too much acid in the stomach. And sometimes there is an overproduction of stomach in the acid. Acid in the stomach. Acid in the stomach. Thank you. Good good thing I have Dr. Benjamin here. Proofreader. Um, my proofreader, exactly. But what we're finding is that actually what is a more common cause of acid reflux is actually having too little acid in the stomach. What? Too little acid leads to acid reflux? How in the heck can that possibly happen? Mm-hmm. How does Great it happen? Question. How does it happen? Well, what you what we need to understand is that um, where the esophagus meets the stomach, there is a sphincter. A sphincter says what? <laughs> a sphincter that closes the two organs from one another so that when we swallow food, the sphincter closes and then the stomach can do all of its action to digest the food. Because otherwise, if you think about the, the action of the stomach, it's you know, it's it's squeezing, it's churning the food, and yeah, if so, they're so for those of you who are able to watch this episode, we're on you know Facebook and we'll be on YouTube and everything. There's an esophagus that you know attaches to the stomach, and the junction of that is meant to be tight and open up when we eat, and then close when we're not eating. So we keep the contents of the stomach in the stomach where the acid is, where the digestive juices are. And we're creating that, you know, nice metabolic digestive, you know, fire in that stomach. And we want it to stay in the stomach. Mm -hmm. We don't want that to come back up the esophagus. So one of the root causes that, if I'm understanding you correctly, Dr. Susanna, is if the stomach is actually too low in acid, it can cause reflux from the stomach back into the esophagus. Yeah. So tell me, walk me through how that happens. (laughs) Well, the sphincter needs a certain amount of acidity to work properly, to shut, to shut that junction between the esophagus and the stomach. So if we don't have enough acid in the stomach, then the sphincter doesn't get the signal to close. So it just stays open. So you can see how it would be very easy for food to reflux back up into the esophagus if there's no closed solid separation between the two. Yeah. So we need enough acid to keep that sphincter closed but too much can also be a problem, right? It's true. Too much stomach acid will erode the stomach lining. It's just going to be too intense for the stomach lining. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that, it's very common for that to progress into 
a peptic ulcer. So before we get into the rest of the conversation, because I know you've got some things up your sleeve, Dr. Susanna, that you want to talk about, but I want to bring forth another potential root cause of gastroesophageal reflux or acid reflux. And in addition to low stomach acid being a really, you know, big root cause that a lot of people experience, uh, another root cause is actually chronic stress. Because if we think about the movement from our mouth through our esophagus, into our stomach, through our intestine, through our large intestine, through our colon, out of our anus, that process is intended to go this way. And that happens when we are innervated properly through the autonomic nervous system. The parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system makes sure that that process is flowing in that direction. It's the rest and digest and uh, eat branch of the nervous system. And on the other hand, chronic stress, which so many people experience is chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which really just blocks that flow and potentially creates backflow. And uh, you know, if you think about the other thing that's, that's you know, amazing to think about is in addition to having the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system moving food, through the digestive system, through the process of peristalsis is the, the, the word that describes the movement of food through the digestive system. Um, we also have gravity that's helping to move the food from our mouth all the way through to our anus and out into the toilet. Uh, so we need to have sympathetic activation of the nervous system to go backwards. And we can only go backwards if we've got some element of stress activating that sympathetic nervous system that's moving food literally in the wrong direction uphill up the esophagus esophagus through the uh you know pyloric sphincter there and back into cause acid reflux and that sort of symptom mm -hmm. yeah not the pyloric sphincter or the lower esophageal <laughs> sphincter. Pylo good thing i'm here now <laughs> So you got the lower esophageal sphincter at the top of the stomach, and then the pyloric sphincter is at the bottom of the stomach. Yeah, there we go. All right. All right. We got our anatomy, and now I want to, so, so low stomach acid is really something that we can fix, right? Well, yes. And so then we need to ask, of course, because at Alter Health, we're always talking about what is the root cause? What is the root cause? So what is the root cause of low stomach acid? And there can also be multiple factors there, but the main one is stress. Okay. All right. I'm glad we, I'm glad we tied <laughs> So we were going to the same place. Yeah. Um, as, just briefly, some of the other causes can be a very devitalized um, diet if you're not eating good quality foods. Um, but also high protein. High protein requires more stomach acid to break down. Mm -hmm. And if we're continually calling upon stomach acid to break down high protein diets in the stomach, then we're simply going to lose stomach acid. And then another thing is the, uh, you know, hydration, drinking, hydration. Th drinking too much water, specifically cold water at the times of digestion. Mm -hmm. So if we're drinking, we want to spit, of course, we're going to be drinking water. We need to properly hydrate. That's so important. And pretty much everyone on this planet is chronically dehydrated, but we don't want to drink while we are eating. Mm -hmm. We want to drink on either side of our meal, ideally like a half hour to an hour spaced away from your meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the last potential cause is an infectious cause. Uh, H. pylori can decrease hydrochloric acid, but it can also increase hydrochloric acid. It's a tricky little bug like that. And then there's also there's also arguments and data showing that SIBO, other you know infectious causes like SIBO can also lead to um, low stomach acid. Um, but then you'll see that there's the reverse argument saying that SIBO stems from hi low hydrochloric acid. So well, it's well, the chicken it, or the egg. It is kind of, uh, you know, if, maybe we can take a minute or two to talk about the importance of stomach acid. In addition to uh, preventing acid reflux, we need stomach acid, like we kind of alluded to, to break down food. That's one of the first things that your food, you know, obviously you're chewing your food, your food, you've got digestive enzymes in your saliva, but once your food gets into your stomach, that's really where the, the big bang begins. Hydrochloric acid is one of the most important things to break down, specifically proteins in your food. 
Uh, but also, you know, there are different digestive enzymes that get into those digestive juices that help break down all of the food macronutrients. Uh, so if we're not breaking down food properly in our stomach, then the food particles are entering our intestines still big, still too big to be broken. Designed to really just start chop things up in smaller pieces and if we've got two pieces too big of pieces to begin with then we can't chop up things small enough to really absorb adequately into the bloodstream into the cells to create cellular energy that process of metabolism it doesn't happen as efficiently and not only that we potentially have uh, the food around to feed uh, potentially pathogenic organisms that feed off of proteins and this uh, put putrefication process happens, uh, this uh, fermentation process happens, it can lead to all sorts of uh, digestive issues and also systemic chronic issues as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like we said before, we needed to close that lower esophageal sphincter. Yeah. For the topic of this conversation, reflux, yes. I, enough stomach acid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where were we before we did that little tangent? We were on the topic of, uh, well, we talked oh, yeah. about all the causes. <laughs> yeah. So back to the main cause of low stomach acid, which is stress. It makes sense that in addition to everything Ben just talked about, the effects of stress on the bottom you know, stimulating the, the sympathetic nervous system going backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The one of the main functions of the parasympathetic nervous system is to increase hydrochloric acid. And when we increase hydrochloric acid, then we increase all of our other digestive juices downstream, like our pancreatic enzymes and our lipase and our wait, so you said the sympathetic you mean the parasympathetic. Didn't I say parasympathetic? Maybe you did and I just had a brain blink. Okay. Um, but yes, the parasympathetic nervous system increases hydrochloric acid as well as all the other digestive juices. Yes. Yes. So if we consider the state of society today, we see so many people running around from one thing to the next. Got to do this. Got to go to work. Got to pick up the kids. Got to make dinner. Got to, 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 just constantly moving, constantly going. Constantly in this sympathetic state. And maybe even eating while they're doing those things. Mm -hmm. And then expecting somehow that this miracle is going to allow the food to go downstream and be absorbed. Like it doesn't really happen unless we are settled, aligned inside of ourselves, aligned with nature and, you know, eating a natural diet. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of foods aren't designed to be digested by humans. And here we are shoving them in our mouths. So the treatment, should we move on to the treatment or the approach to? Yeah, I okay. think it's, a, it's, it's time to do so. All right. So approaching acid reflux from a holistic, you know, root cause understanding of what's going on. Obviously, I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Susanna, but I would imagine that food choices, nutrient, you know, our diet is really important. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the foods that really aggravate acid reflux? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, well, there's, that, that we should avoid. Yeah, there's a fun acronym. Crap. Yeah, cut out the crap. <laughs> and see, and, and the thing about this, I want to say, is that this is more about palliating symptoms. This is not so much about treating the underlying cause. Right. If the underlying cause is, is, is uh, stress, then if we cut out the crap, it's going to allow the body to potentially heal itself but it's not necessarily going to fully allow the body to heal itself if we still are running around in that stressful, you know, uh, you know, hormonal response with all the adrenaline and cortisol and other stress hormones coursing through our parasympathetic or our sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the C in crap stands for chocolate. Chocolate also loosens up the lower esophageal sphincter, unfortunately. Uh, cigarettes. Those aren't those aggravate. Those actually just kind of aggravate the stomach lining yeah. directly. Are cigarettes good for anything? Well, <laughs> actually, they they are. They suppress the immune system. So some autoimmune conditions actually people who smoke cigarettes 
are able to relieve their symptoms to some degree while smoking, while, you know, smoking cigarettes. But that's not a treatment that we recommend for autoimmunity no, or anything it's else. It's not a true, true treatment. <laughs> um, and then, and then the last C is coffee or, or caffeine. caffeine, but mainly coffee because coffee is so acidic. Um, this is one of the food items that's very hard for Yes. And then when we move on to R, we, they include refined carbohydrates. So this basically includes any kind of junk food and also, uh, RX, which is an abbreviation oh, yeah. for prescriptions because there actually are quite a few pharmaceuticals that can cause acid reflux. And those include things like ibuprofen, aspen, aspen, aspirin, <laughs> If we I, if we I need spend, a serious autocorrect today. Yeah, if I'm if I spend too much time in Aspen, I might get some reflux. <laughs> and then um, bisphosphonates is coming to my head. Oh, certain antibiotics. There's a whole list, yeah. but those are some of the main ones. So C R. Mm -hmm. And then A. And this stands for well, first allergies. You want to cut out any foods you might be allergic to. Um, and then also acidic foods. Acidic acidic foods can be very triggering for people who do have overproduction of acid in their stomach. But today we're talking about hypochlorhydrate. We're talking about too little acid in the stomach. So actually people that have too little acid in the stomach should be fine with acidic foods and should actually feel better digestion when they what eat. What are some examples of acidic foods? Great question. So those would be things like vinegars, um, tomatoes, Lemon. lemons, yeah, any kind of citrus um yeah, pineapple so, those acidic kind of fruits so it's it's uh you know this is kind of a uh what's the word i'm kind of nuanced a nuanced and and uh there's a lot of it's it's kind of a poorly understood concept acidic foods um a lot of acidic foods are actually alkalinizing to the body so don't understand this the wrong way they like in themselves they have an acidic content but once they're digested and metabolized by the body they can actually be very alkalinizing so we don't want to think of these foods as you know bad acidic foods like lemons and pineapple and these things that tend to be acidic just right. in and of themselves but once we eat them or drink them or bring them in we're going to be healthy if we can handle them mm -hmm. but they can be provocative and trigger that sort of symptom yeah. of reflux. I'd say, you know, again, more provocative for people who might have an ulcer or too much stomach acid. Yeah. Yeah. And then moving on to P, P uh, includes peppermint because peppermint is also one of those things that, that loosens the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and then pop, which if you're not from Michigan means soda. What's pop? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Any yeah. Michiganders out there? Um, and then also there's another, oh, packing it in. So overeating. Did you, did you uh, brush up on these? I brushed up on these. I do not remember. The, <laughs> I remember crap very well, but I don't remember all of the different components of crap. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is a fun, this is a fun acronym that we learned in medical school, but really when we consider what foods are going to be most healing for acid reflux, we are looking at a whole food plant-based diet. Of course, this is the food that our body was designed to digest. There may be some foods that are harder for you to digest while you are still building up your digestive fire. Um, however, this is this is ultimately the diet that we want to move in the move in the direction towards. Yeah, these foods, you know, whole foods are easily broken down, easily digested. Digested. They don't take too much hydrochloric acid, like higher protein foods. If we're like we said, if we're constantly bringing in high protein foods, we're needing more and more acid to break that break that down, and that just exacerbates the symptoms potentially. Mm -hmm. So whole food, plant-based, and then stress, you know, we just, yeah. Before we go to stress, um, cause we're kind of talking about things that, that don't really like totally address the underlying cause. There are a lot of, there are a lot of supplements, herbs that can soothe the mucosa, make yeah. it feel really good, palliate the symptoms. There are the digestive bitters that promote your digestive juices. And then there's kind of things that palliate, like, you know, the demulcent herbs that are soothing. Uh, but the digestive bitters don't palliate symptoms. They can actually kind of jumpstart, kickstart the process. Yeah. So first, first, I just want to talk about that 
there are herbs that palliate the symptoms. And those are things like licorice, slippery elm, marshmallow root, aloe, then the then when we think and there's nothing inherently wrong or bad about these they just don't necessarily directly address the root cause right exactly then we can look at strengthening the weakened system so strengthening our weakened you know stomach function and there are a few different approaches to that and one is well you can you can just replace hydrochloric acid by taking take a that. yeah take a hydrochloric acid supplement but mm -hmm. that once again is not going to really address any sort of root cause in fact, I think there is some theory that taking hydrochloric acid exogenously sends the signal to your body, hey, I don't need to make my own acid. I've got this capsule coming in, and I don't actually need to call up upon those parietal cells in the stomach to put out hydrochloric acid. So we want to do that cautiously, sparingly, kind of just hopefully in the greater context of sort of some sort of healing individualized protocol. Mm -hmm. Other ways to replace or to support an acidic environment in the stomach is to take a little bit of apple cider vinegar or lemon juice with your meals before your meals, 10 to 15 minutes before your meals. And then there's the bitters. The bitters. Sorry that I spoiled that <laughs> surprise. Bitters are great bitter herbs. Anything that you that you put in your mouth and then it kind of triggers that bitter taste response and makes you kind of cringe. Anything that does that is going to be supportive of your digestive process. It kind of jump starts the digestive system, gets the hydrochloric acid producing, gets all the other digestive enzymes flowing. So some examples of bitter herbs are artichoke, leaf, and um, gentian. Gen gentian is kind of classic. Uh, even dandelion, dandelion leaf. even uh, Anything, anything. <laughs> Sorry, it's vacation, you guys. We're... Ben's got vacation brain. I guess I do. I didn't know I did. Until yeah, now. but there's great bitter formulas that you can find at the store. Yeah. And so the other thing that helps promote hydrochloric acid production is celery juice. Celery juice. All right. All right, celery juice, 16 ounces on an empty stomach in the morning. That has been helping a lot of people with their acid reflux. Thank you, Anthony William, Mr. Mm -hmm. Medical Media. Uh, and can we talk about stress for just a second? Because really what I want to do is just tell people to go back and listen to episode number 119 where we, you know, really for the first time in a long while, at least dove in to really diffuse the stress bomb that so many people are living with in their lives. Mm -hmm. So we are not going to get into that any deeper today, but we do talk about stress all the time in our clinical practice and in our healing community meetings, really important thing to get a handle of. And when we're talking about getting a handle of, it's really just cultivating an understanding of where stress comes from and how stress can be supportive and not something that you have to run and hide from. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, exactly. And really, yeah, addressing stress is, is probably going to be the, uh, the, the biggest, the most, uh, you know, transformational key to healing yeah. acid reflux. And it all comes together because like when we address stress, then we make more self-honoring, self-nurturing choices with regard to our food and our diet. We're not acting and responding and reacting in a way that is in this kind of sympathetic cycle. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we are, you know, relating with stress in a way that allows us to have healthy thinking, you know, peace of mind, clarity of mind, so that we can just move in our world and operate in our world in a self-honoring, self-nurturing sort of way. It's true. And I know we should go soon, but we really should. <laughs> I just want to briefly shout out the practice of food hygiene. This is where okay. you <laughs> this is where you can support parasympathetic activity of the nervous system to really optimize digestion at your mealtime. So it's a set of yeah. practices that you can apply around your meal times. Um, yeah, like I said, to really optimize digestion and they include things like taking a few deep breaths. So before the meal, you wanna make sure you're grounded. You wanna make sure you're in a proper state, breathe. And a, another great way to get there is through gratitude. You know, gratitude kind of shortcut 
right to the parasympathetic. We don't want to be shoveling food into our mouth and, you know, forcing things down because that, what is, what was the P in crap? Packing it in. We don't need to pack it in because that just, you know, it overwhelms the digestive process. So you want to take it easy, maybe put your fork down between bites. You chew. want to chew thoroughly so that your saliva has a chance to break down the food as well. Yeah. The salivary amylase. Yeah. And you also want to make sure there aren't any super distracting things around you, like your TV or your screen. Even reading a book can kind of take you, it can definitely take you out of the present moment of just being present with your food. Um, and if you're not eating with a loved one, if you're just eating alone, be present with yourself, you know, don't, yeah, just be present with yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you are eating with a loved one, be present with your loved one and your food. So those are our tips around food hygiene. And then, you know, at the end of the meal, like don't overeat, you know, it's okay if you don't finish your plate, save leftovers. That's a good practice as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So and, that's- And don't, yeah. don't, eat when you're walking or running or driving or anything like that yeah. always be at a table <laughs> all this stuff is really wrapped up and packaged wonderfully in our latest course offering medicinal living it's true where we we actually spend a lot of time talking about food hygiene and of course the healing diet and understanding exactly how and why the healing diet does support the body in healing itself so if you want to learn more about this course, which is life-changing, I think it has the opportunity to be life-changing. If you put your 100% effort into it. If you are engaged, <laughs> www.alter.health slash course. And remember, we're giving away all of our podcast listeners for a period of time, a discount. What's the, what's the coupon code? I don't know. I thought you made it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, we, we, we vacation are, brain. We are going to we are going to make a coupon code and give it to you. But if but let's just come up with the code now. Okay, the code is Alter Your Health. Alter your health. We're gonna give you guys who are listening a coupon code for how many percent? Twenty. Twenty percent! You heard it from Dr. Susanna. Twenty percent off <laughs> to the medicinal living online course www.alter.health course. Use the code Alter Your Health. Yeah, this is special, guys. This is is very special. Okay, so that that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you. Sorry, this one was a little bit longer. Feel free to like. Feel free to subscribe. Feel free to share this information with anyone that you love. Anyone who might be struggling with acid reflux. There's so many people in the world who are. So thank you for, for healing yourself. Thank you for supporting the planet and healing herself. And thank you for spreading the health information along with us. We do really appreciate you. Yeah, bye for now. We'll be back next week. Take care, you guys.